Well, praise the Lord, church. Welcome to our church service today via the electronic devices. I'm so glad that you can be with us today. Those of you that were with us last Sunday in Lexington in our in-person church service, my, we had a great time. The Lord came down and visited in a mighty way. There was healings that was re that uh, were reported after the service that happened during our communion service. And we just had a great time in the Lord. We were able to ordain uh, a new minister, Sister Inez Reeves. Uh, last year, she was ordained a deaconess. And this year, uh, due to her faithfulness, dedication, and her much uh, progress in the Word of God, we have ordained her a minister in the church. So these were great things that uh, happened in our service there in Lexington last Sunday. This week, we are back to our uh, electronic service, and I'm glad that you have joined in with us. And we ask that you would just gather your mind and, and your thought processes and let's come to church. Uh, we're not together physically, but yet we are together, aren't we? Through the means of uh, this uh, media that we are so blessed to have access to today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, there are uh, people that we need to pray for today. Sister Sheila Lamb from Virginia has sent us a prayer request today, and she is about to go into the hospital for a serious operation that uh, has to do with uh, the, the bone structure around her uh, brain cranium, and we want to lift her up to God in prayer. We want to pray for Sister Inez Reeves today that God would strengthen her and to be her ever-present help in time of need. Continue to pray for Diane. Diane continues to recover from a sickness uh, in January. And uh, others, we are praying for uh, Annette today that has asked for prayer. And uh, we also praying for Maydell, who has had a long bout of the COVID and now has been moved out of the hospital and in, in, into a nursing home. So these are things that we're calling out to God today about. So join with me and let's pray. Most gracious heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness today as we study your word. And we bring these uh, individuals up to you in prayer Father, that we have just mentioned. God, we pray for Inez. God, that you would strengthen her and give her opportunity to witness and bear witness to your name. Father, we also uh, pray today for Sheila Lamb that is going to have corrective surgery on a, a bone that is in her head that is somehow... Uh, allowing the fluid around her brain to leak out through her ear. Now, Lord, this sounds uh, serious to us, but we know that for you, it's just a small thing. So we ask that you would touch her and heal her in the holy and in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God, we pray for Diane, that you would continue to heal her body, God, from the sickness that she has come through uh, in January, in the first part of February. Lord, we pray for Maydell, God, that her recovery would continue and she would be restored to her home and to her children and her grandchildren. Lord, we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, also we lift up Otis Lomax in prayer today, who is having uh, some heart challenges and on April the 1st, he's going back for some, uh, uh, for some tests and some further research. God, and we pray that we will get a good report uh, from, that, from those tests and from that examination. Lord Jesus, we lift all up in prayer today. God, that have asked requests, those who have asked 
unspoken requests. God, we ask that you would be mindful of those. You know what it is that they have need of. Lord, so we intercede for them in the holy and mighty name of Jesus. Bless our church family today, wherever they may be, those of our church in Lexington, those of our church, uh, dear God, in San Antonio, those in our church, God, in uh, Fort Kent, Maine, those in our church, Lord Jesus, in uh, East Tennessee, those that are worshiping with us, Lord, in the islands of the world, God, and in distant countries. God, we have people that are in Africa, people that are in the Philippines, people that are in India, Lord, that are worshiping with us. So we ask that you would be real there as we know that you are. God, for time and space is no challenge or barrier to you. So we just give it all into your hands and in your keeping. We ask it in Jesus' name, hallelujah. And everybody said, amen and amen. So much to pray about today. Uh, I ask you to there, wherever you are in your homes or wherever you are today, that you uh, would keep these things that I have prayed about in prayer until we get a good report. We need to keep Keep sending our prayers to heaven until we get a favorable answer. Praise God. Because you continue to ask the same request over and over again, that's not an indication of a lack of faith. That is an indication of your persistence, amen, in asking God until he answers. And he taught us to do that, you know. There's a song today that I want to share with you, and it's in page 49 of our song books, Sing Unto the Lord. And uh, the course of this verse says, Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. That's the name of the song revive us again. And it goes somewhat with the scripture lesson that I'm going to bring in just a moment. But the verses are very uh, interesting and uh, inspirational. Listen to the verses. We praise thee, O God, for the son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. And the second verse is, we praise thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who, was, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Can you say praise the Lord? And the last verse Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. And the chorus, hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Sing it with me again. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. We have a dear brother that uh, was baptized in our church there and uh, has uh, since moved uh, back to his home in Boston, Massachusetts. And his name is Earl, Brother Earl. And uh, I want to pray for him. I just feel a special burden to pray specially for Brother Errol right now. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to follow the leading of the Spirit. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we lift our brother up to you in prayer. He's there in Boston. Lord, and I'm sure that he's praying as 
he is known to do. And I'm sure that he's studying the word of God. And I'm sure he's witnessing to his family, his children, his grandchildren. But Lord, I lift him up in prayer to you today. And I ask that you would strengthen him and let him feel your everlasting arms and closing about him. And let him know that his church family in Tennessee still holds him dear in our hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I have a special lesson today that I'm going to entitle Putting the Colonel Back in the Husk. Yes, you heard that right. Putting the Colonel Back in the Husk. Amen. I'm going to take a scripture text today from the book of uh, Second Kings, I believe it is. And it is chapter four. So give me just a minute to get there. Second Kings chapter four and in verse uh, number 42. Now here, uh, the writer is uh, rehearsing the miraculous events surrounding the life of the prophet Elisha. Elisha, you will remember, was the understudy or the servant of the great prophet Elijah. And Elisha was the young man that Elijah took to him to be his cupbearer, if you would, to be his adjutant, uh, to be his assistant. And then when Elijah, the older prophet, was taken up into heaven, with a chariot of fire and a whirlwind, you remember that story, that uh, Elisha would not leave him all that day for he knew the Lord was going to take him away. So Elijah asked Elisha what he wanted from him. And he said, I want a double portion of your anointing. Now we're going to be talking about anointing today. Now, when we talk about anointing, we're talking about the Holy Ghost. Amen. We're talking about the spirit of the almighty God. That's the anointing. And here in 2 Kings chapter uh, 4 and in verse 42, uh, we read, and there came a man from Be'ah Shalasha and brought the man of God, that's Elisha, the man who received a double portion of the older prophet's anointing, brought the man of God, uh, bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and full ears of corn in the husk thereof, now, you know, this is encouraging to me because I'm reading about where people brought the man of God gifts. I enjoy receiving gifts. As a matter of fact, my livelihood re requires it and depends upon it. One of the hardest things for, for yours truly to ever learn to accept from God's people uh was the gifts that they would bring, the monetary gifts. Sometimes they would be at the grocery store and they would see something they would think their pastor would like or need and they would purchase it for me. And on Sunday, they would bring it to church. You know, people come to church, not only bringing pocketbooks, but they come to church bringing garden produce. They come to church bringing groceries. Uh, they come to church bringing uh, a wide assortment of things that enhances my life that makes my life possible actually and i'm really thankful for that and i'm sure that the man of god here was very thankful for the things that uh, was brought to him these were uh particular things they were things that uh, he needed to uh for uh sustenance now let me read it again and brought the man of god bread of the first fruits 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn in the husk. And he said, give unto the people that they may eat. Now, there's another thing about the man of God. 
the man of God receives from the people. But then he gives out. He gives out to the people. The Bible says that you should not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, talking about the, uh, the ministry. They should not be put on a, a limited salary or they should not be limited what they get. Why? Because it flows from the people into the man of God, from the man of God back into the community the way that it is needed. So when you take an ox and you harness him to the treadmill and he walks around and around in circles, moving the great grinding wheel, and they put in the, the wheat and they put in the grain and they put in all of the products that the ox is going to be grinding, now, one of the requirements, one of the laws in the Old Testament was that the farmer could not muzzle that ox. He had to be at liberty to reach over into that trough and take out whatever he needed to eat for his own strength and for his own sustenance. And that is used as an illustration how that the man of God should not be limited to the blessings that flows into his home and flows into him because he then uh, doesn't become a dead sea that just receives and it stops there. But as it comes to him, then he gives out and he flows out. Uh, the table of the pastor is a table that feeds many, many people besides just his family, his children, but it feeds other children in the community and other families in the community as well. And that's what we're reading here. The people brought Elisha, the man of God, these gifts of the first fruits of their harvest. You know, that's what tithes are. Tithes are a first fruit of what comes into us. We take right off the top that first fruit, that first 10%, and we bring it to the house of God. Amen. And not only that, but there were 20 loaves of barley, barley that had just been harvested and, and baked into loaves, and full ears of corn in the husk. Now, when this was brought to the man of God, then the man of God, he was, he was over a, a group of 100 men, we are to learn later in the uh, in this chapter that were called, that was called the school of the prophets. So when the man of God received this gift, then he told his servant, feed the other men. And uh, the servant was alarmed. He said, well, how on earth will this, th th this is a lot for you, for, for the, you know, for the bishop, but if you're going to take it and feed a hundred other ministers with it. It's not enough for that. And then Elisha said, you just do as I said. Take what I have given you and feed the men and see if there will, will not be enough to feed them and more left over besides. And we, we remember uh, the story of Jesus feeding the great multitude with the loaves and the fishes and there being 12 baskets full of fragments remaining. Well, pretty much the same thing happened here. They had a little, it was a lot for one man, but this one man said, I want to take what has been given to me and I want to feed those who are under me. So then when he began to feed the hundred men in the school of the prophets, well, that that was brought to the one man was enough to feed the whole congregation of the school of the prophets. And that was a miracle, amen. But my thought today is something else something a little bit different, but we're taking it from this particular text. And what I've just said, I wasn't planning on saying, but somebody needed to hear it. So that's why the Holy Ghost prompted me to say it. And I try to listen to the Holy Spirit. But it's interesting to me that this scripture says that one of the things that was brought to Elisha were full ears of corn in the husk. Now, it wasn't corn like we have. We have corn that uh, is really a North American uh, vegetable, 
and uh, Europe and the Middle East, and especially in Bible days, they did not have this. But what the King James calls corn is just grain. So I'm going to use, however, a uh, ear of maize, or what we call corn. And I'm going to illustrate this lesson today. They brought the man of God full ears of corn in the husk. It wasn't husked. It wasn't, you know, the, the ear was not taken out of the husk. It was in the husk. And I want to talk to you about this today because some years ago, I believe that God gave me uh, some knowledge through the word of knowledge, one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, that the Lord's church that I knew as the Pentecostal church was going to morph. And it was the image of the Lord's church was going to change. It was going to appear, uh, eventually have an appearance different than what I was used to. And the Lord, I feel like, spoke to me and said, I want you to prepare for this morphing of my church. And I began to uh, seek God as to what that meant and what he was trying to say to me. And I feel like the Lord was trying to say to me that my people, the Pentecostal tongue-talking, Jesus' name baptized people, have in, 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 their, in their appreciation of my anointing, in the appreciation of my spirit, have laid down the symbols of the faith. And the Holy Ghost was saying, I'm not pleased with that. And the Lord was saying that my people have the kernel. They prophesy for real. They have the kernel. They have the fruit, but they don't have the husk. And the thing that is important is not only the kernel, but also the husk that surrounds the kernel. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. And the gift that the man of God was brought was full ears of corn, and I'm using this to represent the grain they brought him, the full ears of corn in the husk. And then he turns and he says to his servant, give this to the people. I want to talk to you about the full ear of corn in the husk. Now, when we talk about the husk, I'm going to liken the husk to the symbols of our faith. Now, some people get uncomfortable when we talk about symbols. When you look at me right now, you're looking at a symbol of Christianity because you see the, the, the bishop's color of the shirt. You see the black color of the bishop's suit. You see the collar of the clergy. What you're looking at here is a symbol of Christianity. And when the Lord gave me this revelation and the word of wisdom that I got years ago, that's when I began to wear the clergy collar and the clergy shirt and the clergy attire because the Lord was saying, I want to put the kernel back in the husk. The husk is the symbol, is the uh, symbolism of our faith. The cross, for instance, that we have in our homes or some of us wear about our neck. It's a symbol, right? And uh, the sign of the cross that we make when we're blessing God's people, that's a symbol. Uh, when we uh, make the sign of the cross on our heads, when we are anointing somebody with oil or on our hearts when we're praying or on our lips when we're praying or speaking God's word, those are symbols they make many people uncomfortable and especially people who are so excited about the kernel 
and about the fruit, about the real principle of the thing that they think they don't need, the symbolicness of the faith. Beloved, that's a mistake. And I'm going to explain to you why that is a mistake. There is a reason that the man of God received the whole ear of corn in the husk. And there's a reason why that that was given to the people. And this ministry of Apostolic Orthodox Church of Lexington, Tennessee, is all about presenting the full ear of corn in the husk. Many churches just have the ear without the husk. And that's what's the important thing. I don't want to be misunderstood. This is what is the important thing. But it's dangerous to only have the ear of corn and not the husk. Now, the Bible talks about those who and have a form of godliness in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Those of you that are taking notes, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Talks about those who have a form of godliness. A form of godliness. Well, you look at them and it appears that they've got the fruit because they've got the form. They've got the husk. In other words, they've got the symbolism all down pat. They've got the collar. They've got the shirt. They've got the suit. Uh, they've got the cross. They've got the Lord's, uh, the Eucharist with the, the bread and the wine. They have the water with baptism. They have the oil for anointing. They have all the, hu they have the husk. They have all the symbols. But when you get there and you open it up and you look what's inside the husk, there's nothing there. Those who have a form, who ha only have the symbolism, but don't have the fruit, don't have the kernel. Well, that's disappointing. As a matter of fact, Paul said in 2 Timothy 3 verses 5 through 7, those who only have the form, but who do not have uh, the power, do not have the power. They have the form of godliness, but nothing happens when they pray. Uh, they talk about uh, confirmation, but nobody speaks in tongues. See, that's what com confirms the individual's faith to the body of Christ is the speaking in tongues. Now, Pentecostals have the fruit and they jump up and down and run the aisles and, and uh, jump pews and, and uh, because of uh, the fruit. But the thing that the man of God received that he dispensed to others was the fruit in the husk. And it's that husk that I want to talk about. Amen. Uh, Jesus talked about he talked about wine and wine skins. He said, no one puts new wine into old skins. Why? Because the old skins have already stretched. And if they put new wine in there and it starts to ferment and expand and get gas and things like that, it'll burst the old wine skin. So what Jesus said, you put new wine into new wine skins and then as that new wine begins to expand, the skin will expand with it. And then both will be preserved, the wine skin and the wine. Well, you see, Jesus was concerned with not only the, the, uh, the preservation of the wine, which that's the principal thing is the wine. But he also was concerned with the preservation of the wine skin that, that helped the wine. Now, if we can take our analogy and we can transfer the wine skin and the wine over to the husk and the ear in the husk. So you see, God is concerned with them both. He's concerned with the husk and he's concerned with the fruit. 
He's concerned with the form of godliness, which are the symbols of our faith. And he's concerned with the fruit of our faith as well. Now, somebody might ask, why is God concerned with the husk? When the ear is in the husk, it's protected from the elements. It can rain, it won't hurt it. It can hail, it won't hurt it. The wind will blow, it won't hurt it. The wind might even blow the stalk ground uh, down and it pound against the dirt, but it won't hurt it because it's in a protective covering. Insects will come, but they won't hurt it because it's in a protective covering. But you know what? Without the husk, if the ear was bare, then it is left open to be attacked by the elements, by insects. And in Pentecost, we have seen that very thing happen because the, the kernel or the fruit had been removed out of the husk. The man of God received, and I know I'm doing this till it's obnoxious, but I want you to get it. He received the full ear in the husk, and it was that that he gave to the people. So the ministry of the Apostolic Orthodox Church of Lexington is to have Christianity in and with its symbols, to manifest Christianity and to shield Christianity, to protect Christianity with the symbols of our faith. Now you see, symbols of the faith are like lines on a highway. They keep you safe. They keep you traveling in the right direction. They keep you out of the theological ditches. And that's why, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. As a matter of fact, let me just go and do that right now. And there are two things that I want to really talk about today, about the symbols of our faith. And one is the bread and the wine of the Holy Eucharist. And the other is anointing with oil for blessing for anointing, for consecration, and also for healing. And why these symbols are so important, because a lot of people today, a lot of churches today have just basically thrown them away and are just acting like that they're not important at all. Now, uh, and when it comes to symbols, when it comes to God's attitude toward the form, God's attitude toward the wineskin, as it were, or in this lesson today, toward the husk of the corn. God's attitude toward that can be seen in the Bible. And it should be pointed out that Yahweh is very serious about his symbols, and uh, which he has, which he has uh, inaugurated, established, instituted, for his people to use. Now, we only need to think of Moses and the smitten rock in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verses 7 through 11. <clears throat> now, Moses was not <coughs> permitted to enter the promised land after leading the children of Israel for 40 years. He wasn't permitted to enter the promise, promised land simply because he failed to maintain God's symbol. You see, God told him when the children of Israel needed water, God told him to take his staff and smite the rock. The Bible tells us that, tells us that that rock was a type of Jesus Christ. And the smiting of that rock was a type of Christ's crucifixion. But now later on, toward the end of the wilderness journeys, the children of Israel got without water again. This time, God told Moses to speak to the rock. There's a great symbol there. There's a great lesson there for us to be learned. But Moses, because he was angry with, with the people, instead of just speaking to the rock, as God instructed, took his staff and struck it again. 
You'd think that's such a little thing. But because he marred one of God's symbols, God would not permit him to enter the promised land with the children of Israel. Then there is a story of Nadab and Abihu in the book of Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Now we might think, uh, that's such a strange thing that they offered strange fire and God struck them for it. But that fire was a symbol that God wanted maintained. Now, one should not only consider that, but then there is the blood of the Passover lamb that was spread on the doorpost of the homes in Exodus 12 and 7. It's just a symbol, but God's serious about his symbol. Then there was the rite of circumcision, the cutting off of the male foreskin of every male child at eight days old. That was symbolic, but in Genesis 17 and 10, God was serious about that symbol. And then there is the oil of anointing that we read about in James chapter 14. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if they've committed any sin, it shall be forgiven them. Anointing of oil with oil is only a symbol, but God's serious about the symbol. Then there's the waters of baptism, Romans 6 and verse 4. The head covering of the Christian woman, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. Uh, and let us not forget the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper in Luke chapter 22, 19 and 20. Now, all of these things that I've just mentioned are symbols that God incorporated into his kingdom to teach certain truths and principles. The symbols weren't the most important thing. The principles that they were symbolic of was the most important thing. But in God's symbols, there is a sacramental union between them and what they represent. Now, it will be acknowledged by everyone that God's very particular concerning the symbols of the principles, so much so that when they're violated, God's judgment in the Old Testament was demonstrated upon the symbol breakers. For instance, in the matter of the smitten rock, neither Moses nor Aaron were permitted to enter the promised land. And then when Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire upon the altar, which was only a symbol that reflected a principle for the people of God, but yet God killed them because they failed to keep his principle, his symbol. The blood of the Passover lamb had to be applied to the doorpost a certain way on the two doorposts and also on the lintel. It was only a symbol. Yet God was particular about his symbol and brought judgment upon those that neglected it. If you think God wasn't serious about his symbol of applying the blood to the doors of the house, uh, when just uh, ask those who didn't apply the blood to the door of their house. How did that work out for them? Not too well. The rite of circumcision was only a symbolic act. Yet God's very particular about the rite of circumcision. So much so that the angel of the Lord was prepared to slay the son of Moses because he had not been circumcised. Exodus chapter 4 verses 24 through verse 26. The oil of anointing and the waters of baptism have a central position in New Testament worship as does the head covering of the Christian woman while in church. The bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper are special symbols, yet when not partaken of in proper faith, believers become sick and some even die because they mishandle God's symbols. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through verse 30. Now, 
church, all these are symbols that God holds sacred. Just as these symbols could not be abused without God's judgment, so too the Christian symbols of leavened bread and fermented wine as the communion elements. Now notice I said leavened bread and fermented wine not unleavened bread and grape juice. God forbid. Why would you mess with God's symbols? Oh, because I don't believe in drinking alcoholic beverage. Well, who in the world are you to be consider yourself more holier than Jesus Christ who turned water into wine? And the governor of the feast said, hey, most people wait until people have well drunk before they serve and then they serve the bad stuff, but you've kept the good stuff for the last. Amen. And uh, and uh, leavened bread, bread that has risen, which is a symbol of the resurrected body of Christ. Amen. Don't mess with God's symbols. Nadab and Abihu were killed because they did. Moses and Aaron could not enter the promised land because they did. People in the New Testament era have become sick because they mishandle the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper. You say, but it's only a symbol, Bishop. Yes, but God is serious about his symbols. It is the husk. It is the husk around the full ear of corn. It protects, it protects what's inside. And without it, then the ear is liable to the elements and is liable to insect attacks. And my, we have seen that in Pentecost. We have seen the, the doctrine and, and the preciousness of our experience with God getting disease ridden by people calling themselves prophets, people calling themselves apostles, people uh, serving uh water and grape juice for the Lord's Supper. And pretty soon when the seriousness of, of the symbol is uh, treated in a lighthearted way, in a cavalier manner, then the lesson and the principle that is taught by the symbol is soon forgotten and people spin off into heresy and into false doctrine. It's true. It's very true, beloved. And I would have you to understand today that God is so concerned with his symbols that he has required the lives of those who treat them uh, cavalier, uh, uh, with, with a cavalier attitude. And even in the Lord's church, many people become sick because they treat the symbols of the Lord's Supper in a haphazard manner. And then there is the anointing with oil. I want to talk about that for just a moment. Because when we talk about anointing with oil, we're talking about the laying on of hands. Do you know that laying on of hands is a doctrine of the apostolic church. It's just not something we do. It's a doctrine. It's like water baptism. It's like the Lord's Supper. There is a doctrine of the laying on of hands. The Bible says so. And the anointing with oil. It is a doctrine. The laying on of hands is symbolic. The anointing with oil is symbolic. But wait a minute. Wait a minute, let me read you these two scriptures. Then I want to drive a stab right here. Then I want to come right back to this. I'm reading Mark chapter 6 and verse 12. And this is Jesus sending his, his disciples out to minister to the people. He says, and they went out and preached that men should repent. And not only that, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. There is a direct relationship between the anointing with oil and the healing. 
there is a direct relationship between the water and the cleansing of sin. There is a direct relationship between the elements of the Eucharist and the Lord's body and the Lord's blood. This relationship is not that the bread and the wine become the body and the blood. This relationship is not that the oil becomes the Holy Ghost. It's not that the water becomes the blood of cleansing. But the relationship is that there is a sacramental union. There is a sacramental relationship between these symbols and what the symbol thus represents. And it's the same thing with the Christian woman's head covering. It's only a symbol, beloved. But there is a relationship between what it is a symbol of and what it represents. So much so that the Apostle Paul says when speaking of a woman's head covering, he calls it power. And he says a woman should have power on her head. So that relationship between the, the symbol of her authority to operate in the gifts of the Spirit and her authority to minister to the church and her authority to lead the congregation in prayer. The head covering is only a symbol of it, but there is a sacramental relationship between that symbol, between that symbol and what it is a symbol of. Amen. Now, I can feel it. I can feel some of you say, well, I don't believe that symbols belong in New Testament Christianity. Well, you're just wrong. You're just wrong. Here, the apostles went forth anointing with oil under the direction of Christ, and many were healed as a result. And to show you that this was carried on after the day of Pentecost, all we have to do is go to the book of James chapter 5, and listen to Bishop James's instruction. James was a bishop. He wore the symbol of the high priest. He wore a high priest mitre on his head because he saw himself as being the bishop of Jerusalem. He saw himself and the church recognized him as being the replacement of the Jewish high priest. So I'm wearing clergy garments. Bishop James wore clergy garments. He wore the garments of the high priest. And so did John. John wore uh, the, the priestly ephod, we are told in early Christian writings. Somebody, however, took the grain out of the husk. And that was wrong. That was so wrong. We were so excited about getting the baby clean during the Reformation era of the church that when we threw the bathwater out, we threw the baby out with it. The symbolism of the faith, beloved, is very important. Look here in James chapter 5 and in verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them, the elders, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And then what will be the result of this? The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So there, the symbols of water baptism. Uh, baptizing in water. And uh, I believe that water baptism, if, if at all possible, should be done by immersion because it's a symbol of a death and a burial. Also, however, the Bible talks about being sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. If being immersed in water is, is not possible for somebody, I don't believe God would reject a baptism by sprinkling or by pouring because both the, 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 the burial and the sprinkling and pouring are legitimate symbols of what happens in baptism, the blood of Jesus Christ, either washing us, bathing us, or being sprinkled with it, or being sanctified with it. However, now, I know I'm going to get some hate mail over that, but that's all right. 
Bishop Hayes is a truth teller. I don't fly anybody's denominational banner. I tell the truth as it is presented in the word of God. Many of you are uncomfortable with my clergy collar. Many of you are uncomfortable with me signing the cross. Many of you are uncomfortable with Eucharist every Lord's Day. Many of you are uncomfortable with uh, the women's head covering that you see at the Apostolic Orthodox Church. Uh, many of you are uncomfortable with anointing with oil. Amen. And some of you that attend churches that actually do anoint with oil, that oil you anointed with has never been blessed. They just went out to Walmart or food giant somewhere and bought a bottle of olive oil, brought it in, set it on the Bible stand, and then started dousing people with it. But you see, there is a sacramental union between the oil and what the oil represents. Our oil is sanctified and consecrated through prayer. You say, well, Brother Hayes, that prayer doesn't do anything. Of course it does. It brings that symbol into a, into a sacramental union with what it is a symbol of. Amen. Now, we look at, let's say, the liturgical churches of the world. We look at, uh, at the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Catholic Church, the Orthodox churches, and there are a plethora, a number of them. Oriental Orthodox churches, and there's a number of those. The ancient church of the East and the Storian church. You look at all of these liturgical churches, they got a high ritual uh, in their worship. Their church craft is very ritualistic. And so many of them, all they have is the husk. All they have is the husk. They don't have the power. For instance, during their, and I used this earlier, I'll reference it again, and I'm fastly closing here, so bear with me. Uh, when they have their confirmations, and the young people, or, or the adults as well, come before the bishop to be consecrated, he'll slap them on the cheek. And that's their, their confirmation. At that slap is when the bishop is supposed to dispense to them the Holy Ghost. And that slap and that little sting on their cheek is their physical feeling and of the Holy Ghost. And when they look back on it in later life, they'll remember that slap and say, well, that's when I was confirmed. That's when I received the Holy Spirit. They have the husk. But when you open it up, the kernel, the fruit's missing. In a Pentecostal church, you repent and you're baptized. Then when you are confirmed, hands are laid on you and you literally speak in other tongues. That's the kernel. That's the fruit. Laying on of hands, they've got that down pat. They've got the husk, they've got the symbol, but they don't have the fruit so much of the time. Now, here is what we must do. Because having the ear outside the husk has made the ear get diseased by insects and plagues and leaves it bare to the elements. So we have a lot of things going on in Pentecost that are a disgrace. We have a lot of things going on in Pentecost that are an embarrassment. We have a lot of things going on in Pentecost that God has absolutely zilch to do with. And it would never have happened if the, if, if the grain was put back, was in the husk. Because the husk would have protected it. The symbols of our faith would have protected it from the charlatans, from uh, uh, demon spirits masquerading themselves as the spirits of God. Heresy and false doctrine that our symbolism protects. Our symbolism is a 
protecting shield around the husk. This is what God wants, beloved. God wants the grain, the ear of corn in its husk. I read you the scripture. Elisha was brought the gift of full ears of corn in the husk, and then he gave it to the people. You see, Elisha represents the ministry. He represents the uh, the fivefold ministry of the New Testament church. What we have been given, beloved, please listen to me. What we have been given is the full ear of corn in the husk, complete with the waters of baptism, complete with the leavened bread and the fermented wine for the Lord's Supper, complete with the oil, complete with the lady's head covering, complete, complete with the laying on of hands, complete. Oh, but we've become so spiritual that we don't need the symbols, so we just lift the fruit out of the symbol and just put it out here in the world where it gets all diseased and all eaten up by all kinds of evil carrying on. What God wants, what God wants, what we were given, what we must maintain is the full ear of corn in the husk. And then when we can pass that on to our posterity, we can pass that on to generations that come after us. Amen. That is the church. Having the goods, but having the symbols that represent, and not only represent, but protects the fruit. Amen. The Lord bless you, beloved. Heavenly Father, I bring this message and I bring these people who have watched today. I bring them to you and I ask that you would anoint their ears to have heard this message and that they may take it to their heart and that they may look upon our symbols, Lord, with more, with greater conviction and a greater love than what they've ever had before. I ask it in the name of Christ Jesus. Would you say amen with me? Amen and amen. Now it's our time to go to the Lord's Supper, to go to our Eucharist, good to go to one of the greatest symbols that we have, the leavened bread and the fermented wine and the water that is mixed with it. Amen. What a beautiful thing. And those of you that are ordained there, you have your bread ready, you have your wine ready. You have your water ready and you're going to take communion with me. And if you can't take communion with me, then I want you to just, just immerse yourself into this communion service that I am about to reenact. And it's being reenacted all over the world today, all over the world today. As the time zones move from one to the other, the Lord's church is meeting in every time zone on the planet. And as those time zones move across the world today, there is a Eucharistic celebration that is sweeping. Oh, hallelujah. is sweeping the globe. Amen. It's going around the globe, correlating with the time zones. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Those in the East have gotten to it before we have. Now it's come our turn here in the central time zone of North America. Now it's our turn. And now we're going to do it. What are we going to do? This little song says it all. I claim the blood Jesus shed on Calvary. Those precious blood stains were shed there just for me in all my sin, my sickness and my pain. When I need healing, I claim 
those precious blood stains. Heavenly Father, we pray our prayer of forgiveness just now. God, I ask forgiveness for myself and for those, Lord, over whom you have placed me as overseer. I ask, Father, that you forgive our sins, those that we know of and those that we're ignorant of today. And none of us are worthy of your body and blood, but we come aware of our unworthiness and we become we come beseeching you to forgive us of our failures, our shortcomings, our sins, and to welcome us at your table today. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. Amen. The night the Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and he gave thanks. He gave a Eucharist, and that's what we do here, a Eucharist, a giving of thanks. And then the Apostle Paul told us to do the same thing repetitively, to keep doing it until the Lord comes back. So, Father, we bless this bread and we thank you for it. This bread that was taken from the earth, from the bounty that you have blessed your people with, we thank you for it. And we thank you for your body that was broken on Calvary for us. Now, Father, we pray that your body that was broken on Calvary have a sacramental union with this bread, and we ask that your body be with this bread, in this bread, over this bread, under this bread, and around it. In Jesus' name, amen. And we break it to commemorate the broken flesh of Christ, and we eat it, the body of Christ. And then after supper, the Lord took the mixed cup And he blessed it after saying to his disciples, this is my blood of the new covenant. Drink ye all of it. For it shed for the remission of the sins of many. So Father, we sanctify this cup and we bless it. And we thank you for the grape, Father, that was harvested from our land and the bounty that you have given us. And we're thankful for your blood that was shed on Calvary for our sins. And we give thanks for your blood. And we ask that your blood be present with this cup, in it, over it, under it, and around it. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, the blood of Christ. Amen. I claim, <coughs> excuse me, the blood Jesus shed on Calvary. Those precious blood stains were shed there just for me and you. In all my sin and I am a servant of God, but I'm a man full of contradictions sometimes, just as you are. So in all my sin, my sickness, and my pain, when I need healing, I claim those precious blood stains. Amen. <coughs> Let us pray our family prayer together in dismissal. Our Father, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, friends, it's my prayer that you go into this week with the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And remember to keep the full kernel of our Pentecostal experience in its husk. That way it's protected and we can pass it on in an unadulterated condition. So it's my prayer, beloved, that God bless you and sanctify you in your body, in your soul, and also in your spirit. Until we're together again, go with God, for he goes with you.